All right. Let's come together this morning in our opening treatment. And let's consider that what we really wish, what we truly desire, is to experience the presence of God. That is what our spiritual growth is all about. Every day, a little more deeply, feeling, knowing, and experiencing the goodness, the power, and the presence of God right here with us, right here as us. So we make that our opening treatment, the recognition that there's only one life, and it is God. All that we can see has been created by that which we call God out of itself. And yet there's so much more that we can't see that is also some part of the divine. It has created the stars and the planets by commanding its very energy to take form, to become matter. It has created the ocean and land It has created the fish and the plants It has created the animals and it has created us by becoming those very things. The very consciousness that we recognize ourselves to be is some part of its consciousness expressing itself as us and through us. We need not look very far away to find the very presence of the divine. It is, as the poet said, nearer than our hands and feet and closer than our breath. Dr. Holmes tells us that what we are looking for we are looking with. So today we release and we let go of every and any idea that tells us that the discovery and the experience of the presence of God is a difficult task. That we must work hard at it. that we must become worthy of it. And instead we accept the simple truth that it is everywhere present. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says the kingdom is here and now and everywhere present, but men just do not see it. Today, we open our hearts and we see it, and we feel it, and we experience it. And we invite God's love and God's wisdom and God's power to fulfill itself as us, 
to give of itself as us in some unique and wonderful way. Our very lives are a gift to the universe as we allow God's love to use them for its purpose. We are grateful for this opportunity to come together today to know these truths, to love and to support each other in our spiritual growth, in our discovery of the divine, in the only place that we will ever be able to find it, within. We recognize that the way that the divine works <clears throat> is through involution and evolution, through love and through law, through the spontaneous creative impulse which this treatment is, then acted upon by law which makes it so according to our belief. That power has taken this word as its command And it is bringing each and every one of us into a closer realization of the presence of God. We release this treatment to that law so certain it is done that we say together, and so it is. <coughs> All righty then, everyone. Well, thank you for being with us, and this is the, uh, the third week in January, and it is the week that we, we go back and take a look at the ideas that are contained in the chapter of the textbook in the beginning, the third chapter, which is what it does. Remember we talked about the thing itself, what, what God is, what is our concept of God, what do we know about God? We talked about how it works. <coughs> And this chapter is titled What It Does. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a lot of the ideas in this chapter are redundant. They're ideas that, that Dr. Holmes has alluded to in previous chapters. But some of the ideas in here are, are totally new. There's, there's just so much. It's a short chapter. And I invite everyone who has a textbook, please take some time today to read through this chapter and allow the ideas that are most relevant to you to, to speak to your heart. It is a short chapter, but there are just so, so many powerful concepts in it, so many powerful ideas that you can go over it many, many times. And each time you go over it, something different will speak to you. Something different will reach out and touch you. It's just a very, 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 very powerful chapter to me even though it's only a few pages long. And one of the first concepts that jumps out at me when he's talking about what it does, remember, it is the divine. It is the creative impulse of the universe. It is God. But he chooses to call it it so that we dissolve our preconceived notions of what it is, our superstitions and, and our fears and our doubts. And we approach it with an open mind, kind of a, a blank mind, a Zen mind. A beginner's mind. What is it? What is this it that has created us all out of itself? So what Dr. Holmes tells us is, is that we human beings, we have made a riddle out of simplicity. We have taken something that is so obvious so simple and we have made it difficult to grasp and because it is done unto us according to our belief if we believe that something is difficult to grasp then it will certainly be difficult to grasp now when I was a youngster growing up and <clears throat> was learning my my catechism lessons you know we were taught about these people who were who were the mystics and the saints. And these were people who had a deep 
personal experience of the divine. And we study their lives, and, and to some degree we pay them honor, you know, in, in feast days and, and different prayers that were offered to them and things like that. And the idea that I got as a, as a child, I don't know that if it's the idea that the teachers wanted to convey or not, but it's certainly the idea that I got as a child, is that these people were somehow different than or special than the rest of us, uh, uh, more special than the rest of us. That somehow they, they, they had been chosen by God for this great revelation of the presence of the divine. And they had spent many, many years of their lives in seclusion, away from the world, living in a, in a monastery somewhere, or in a cave somewhere, or in the desert somewhere, you know, living, living a meager existence, and keeping their thoughts focused entirely on God the entire time, until, until through the grace of God, through this blessing of God, through this, this choice that God had made, <clears throat> to reveal its presence to them. But for the rest of us, for the, for the blue-collar <clears throat> families of the world, for the rest of us that had to go to work and had to make a living and, and, and all of those things, the best that we could hope for was to simply obey the commandments and go to church on Sunday, <clears throat> contribute to the, to the support of the church, and do, do the things that we were told to do. And then someday, someday, when we die, someday when, when the resurrection comes, someday at the end of the world kind of ideas, then, then we might get to experience, to some degree, we might get to experience the presence of God. So the idea that I got as a child was that there was really no sense in, <clears throat> in expecting to experience the presence of the divine the same way that the saints and the mystics did because that was something for people who had been especially chosen for that experience. That was for people who had found themselves in the circumstances or been attracted to the circumstances where they could devote their entire lives to that purpose, that they could withdraw from the world, the world of distractions, and they could go into, into the cloistered life and that this was somehow a requirement for the experience of the presence of God. Now, what, what that's to say is, is that's to say that it embedded in me an idea that <clears throat> experiencing God was difficult. And I believe that. And, of course, it's done unto us according to our belief. And if we grow up in a world that tells us that God is far, far away out there somewhere and we are down here and, and we, can't, we can't have that experience unless we're especially chosen, unless we have unique circumstances, well then of course we never will. And what Dr. Holmes tells us when he says that we have made a riddle out of simplicity, it just reminds me of, of that experience. Our society, our culture, worships busyness. It worships things that are hard. You know, it's, it, it's just, if you look at the things that are on TV, if, if it's very, very difficult and somebody does it, well, well that's worthy of being put on TV. You know, if, you, if you've been watching the news at all this week, <clears throat> there was a, a story about a man who had climbed by himself all the way to the, the top of uh, Denali in Alaska, the highest mountain in uh, North America. And he did it in January, which is the coldest, darkest month of the year. So it, it's not that it's hard enough to do it in the summertime. He had to wait until it was wintertime. He had to wait until it was dark. And he had to, he had to do it all by himself. In other words, he, he created, he deliberately created a set of circumstances that made this task as difficult as he could conceive. And in so doing, then his accomplishment became even greater. We also saw in the news for, for a week, there were two climbers that were going up the face of uh, El Capitan in Yosemite, and they were they were barehanded climbers, and they were going up the uh, the face of El Capitan, and a 
apparently nobody had ever done that before. It was so difficult. And every morning the news would come on and they would talk about how far these men had gotten and how how bruised their their fingers and toes were from trying to find little little handholds and little crevices to, to hold on to. And again, the point is, is that because it was so difficult, it was it was something that was to be perceived as a great accomplishment. So what we have done in our society, because we we kind of have glorified that which is difficult, we find ways to make things more difficult than they need to be. We just simply do, you know. We, uh, <clears throat> we for example, we pay professional athletes millions of dollars a year because to do what they do at, at the level of ability that, that they do it is extremely difficult. None of us could get out on a football field or a basketball court or a baseball diamond and, and perform uh, the tasks that they do. They're so difficult, and they are the best of the best. Only the best of the best rise to that level. And we pay them, we pay them all of this money. But if what they were doing suddenly became easy to do, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be so entertained by it. And if you look at, I know you've heard me say this before, but if you look at the game of basketball, when, when the, the height of the basketball hoop was established, the average height of, of the players was, was a little over five feet tall. Well, over time, what we did was we recruited people who were very tall to play basketball. And they got very good at playing basketball, and and the points scores, you know, kept running up. It be kept the game, the points that were scored in a game kept getting higher and higher. So, in order to make the game more difficult, they introduced the three-point shot, which basically says if you take the shot from farther away and it goes in, you'll get an extra point. Why? Because it's more difficult. It's more difficult. Gold and silver. Are very valuable because it's hard to get them. It's it's rare, you know. Beach sand, on the other hand, is is not worth that much. You can't you can't set up a, st a stand on the side of the road and sell beach sand. Nobody will stop and buy it. But in the mountains of North Carolina, people had set up stands on the side of the road where they were selling rubies. People would stop and buy rubies because rubies are hard to find. They're very rare. So what Dr. Holmes tells us is that we have made a riddle of simplicity. We have, we have made this idea of experiencing the presence of God more difficult than it needs to be. He calls the science of mind, he calls it practical mysticism. And he tells us that a mystic is not a mysterious person, but rather someone who deeply senses the inner presence of God. And practical mysticism to me means two things. The first thing is, is it means that we can do it right here where we are, going to work in the world as it is, making a living in the world as it is, doing our chores, all of the things that we have to do practically in order to live in the world. We can do this and we can experience the presence of God while we are doing it. <clears throat> One of the greatest mystics of the, the of the medieval times is Brother Lawrence. And Brother Lawrence was not an educated man. He was he didn't have enough of an education to become a priest. But he wanted to serve in the monastery, so they made him a cook. And he he had a, he had a little sign in, in his kitchen, so, you know, God of pots and pans and all things, let me see you in, in everything I do. Some, something to that effect. The words are not exact. And Brother Lawrence became one of the best-known mystics of that period. All of the all of the monks with college educations who are ordained as priests are forgotten. But Brother Lawrence wrote a tiny little booklet. He wrote it seven or eight hundred years ago. It's called Practicing the Presence, and it endures to this day. Because what Brother Lawrence was telling us is that it doesn't have to be hard. That the love of God is already right here. It is already right now. 
and we look too far away for it. Dr. Holmes tells us that we are like fish looking for water. The fish heard that there's this tremendous, tremendous thing called water, that water gives them life, that without water they could not live. And they swim about, darting from here to there to everywhere, asking the other fish, have you seen the water? Do you know where the water is? Do you know how we can find the water? How can we experience the water? And yet they are the water. The water surrounds them. The water flows through them. Their bodies are mostly water. Everything about them is water. And they just don't know it. And they go looking for it. And this is the, this is the image that Dr. Holmes invites us to have. We have made a riddle out of simplicity. The farmer in the field has experienced the presence of God. Every one of us holding a newborn babe in our arms has experienced the love of God. The artist sitting down, allowing the essence of beauty to throw, flow through her brushes, experiences the presence of God. And this experience is not something that is reserved for only those special people that God chooses, or only those who have the ability to go live in a monastery on the top of a hill far, far away and spend eight or ten hours a day in prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. It is the experience for each and every one of us who will learn how to cooperate with what it does. Dr. Holmes tells us that we should never expect to get anything out of a principle that is not already contained in the principle. We have to understand how it works. And then we have to cooperate with the way that it works. And what we have done as human beings over the thousands and thousands of years that, that human beings have been contemplating this is we have tended to create a God that is in our image and likeness. You know, Scripture tells us that we have been created in the image and the likeness of the divine. That means that we're of its nature. As a wave is of the nature of the ocean, we are of the nature of God. It has created us out of itself. What else could we be? Where did these bodies come from but the dust of the earth? Where did the earth come from but the energy of the divine taking form? Where did the intelligence and the consciousness come from that functions through these bodies? And it must be some, some very part of the divine itself, some spark of the divine itself that is expressing itself as us. That's what it means that we are made in the image and the likeness of the divine. Not that it looks like us and has hands and feet and a nose and those sorts of things but that we are its very nature, or its very nature is us. And yet what we have done <clears throat> intellectually, what we have done through our fear and through our superstition is, is that we have created a concept of God that has made God more like an angry tyrant, an oriental king, as, as uh, Emmett Fox would say, a cranky oriental king sitting on a throne, dispensing kindness to some and, and punishment to others. And we have, through our fear and through our superstition, we have created a concept of God that cannot possibly be like God. And then we expect it to work according to the concept of it that we have created. We expect it to bless our friends, but to curse our enemies. We expect it to do special favors of dispensation for us by reversing the laws of nature, if you will, in our, in our favor, by suspending the very laws of nature for us. 
but keeping them in place for other people. I once saw a program of, uh, of a family where a child had been very sick and the family had been praying uh, very intently and, and the child was healed. And, it, and a, it's just beautiful, beautiful demonstration that this child was healed. And they asked one of the older siblings, a child about 16 or 17, they asked him, well, how did he think prayer worked? And he said, well, he says, uh, he says, there are saints in heaven, he says, and saints have a special relationship with God, and God does favors for them. And if we ask the saints to ask God for a favor, then God will go and, and do, a, do, a, do a favor for the saint by giving us the miracle, and that's how it works. And that was the young man's understanding. That was his explanation. That was his belief. And, of course, it is done unto us according to our belief. But we have to recognize that the divine can't do favors for one and not do favors for another. The divine cannot choose one part of itself over another part of itself. That it must treat us all equally because it knows us all equally. It knows us all as part of itself. So we have to stop expecting the divine to work in a manner that it is not capable of working. We have to stop expecting it to do favors for us, to do things for us that it has created us to do for ourselves. So here's an example of that. And this, I cannot tell you how many times in my life that I have heard this. And people would, would essentially say, I don't have to make any choices because God knows what I need and God will give it to me. But the divine created us to make choices. It gave us free will. It gave us the ability, the responsibility, and the accountability for our choices. We can make a choice not to choose. That is a choice that we have made. But it will not make a decision for us. It will not make our choice for us. We have to remember that there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our own belief, a law of mind, we call it. The doer of the word in traditional Christianity. And it is always responding to us according to our belief. Whether that belief is a conscious belief that is one that we are aware of, or whether it is a subliminal belief or a subconscious belief, if you wish to call it that. Something that we believe to be true, but we don't, we don't even know that we hold that belief. The law is constantly acting upon our belief. Conscious, subconscious. The totality of our being, our thoughts, our emotions, our subconscious beliefs. And when we say that we're not going to choose, what we are saying is that we have made a decision to allow, to allow the law to act on our subconscious beliefs, and we will accept whatever we get, and we will call it God's will. That's exactly what we have done. So we have to remember that we cannot expect the divine to do something that is not contained in its own nature. And by its own nature, it cannot choose for us. It cannot decide for us. We can open ourselves up to inspiration. We can open ourselves up to knowing. We can open ourselves up to inspiration and ideas and allow them to come into our awareness and it may seem like God is revealing things to us but God is only revealing to us that which we have 
accepted that which we have, if you will, asked for, that which we have attuned ourselves to. So we have to get this image that we, like the fish in the ocean, <coughs> excuse me, that we human beings here on earth, we are immersed in God's presence. We are surrounded by it. It is flowing to us. It is flowing through us. And it is constantly responding to us according to our belief. And that what we, what each and every one of us are doing is we are attuning ourselves to some particular ideas to some particular things to some particular ways to some particular power and like the the old time preacher example turn your radio on and listen to the music in the air there's there's god is broadcasting on many channels at the same time if you want to consider it that way and each and every one of us are tuned in to kind of a narrow spectrum we have unique interests, unique desires, unique attention. And we are each looking at some tiny, tiny part of that which is infinite. But that which is infinite gives of itself willingly and freely <laughs> to anyone who is willing to cooperate with how it works. So the mathematician has her mind focused on the principles of mathematics and God reveals itself to the mathematician as the principles of mathematics. The artist, the artist has his consciousness attuned to the essence of beauty and capturing it in his art. And the omniscience of God reveals to him the principles of art. The musician, the scientist, the philosopher, the saint, each and every one of us, each and every one of us draws from the same well. Each and every one of us can only receive from that which is willing to give everything. We can only receive as much as we attune our consciousness to accept. It can give us no more than we are willing to receive. And our asking and our accepting, in, in the terminology of ask and it shall be done unto you, our asking is necessary because it is our act of reception. And if you remember the, the story in the New Testament, but Jesus was telling, telling his followers, he says, the Father in heaven, Spirit, the divine, <coughs> excuse me, God. Spirit knows what you need before you even ask. But ask believing, and it shall be given unto you. Well, if the Almighty God in heaven knows what we want before we ask, why do we have to ask? Why doesn't it just give it to us? Why isn't the person who says, God knows what I, what I need more than I do, I'll just let God make the decision. Why isn't that person right? Because there's another piece to the way it works. We must accept we must accept believing in our hearts that it is done. It cannot give to us that which we will not accept, that which we have not attuned our consciousness toward. It cannot force itself upon us. Divine love cannot force itself upon us. As the poet says, it waits in quiet repose for us to make the discovery that it is already here, but it cannot force itself upon us. Meister Eckhart lovingly says that God is like, like the child 
playing hide and seek, who clears its throat so you will know where it is, so you will find it. God is lovingly waiting for us to discover its magnificence. So the mystics and the saints of old that, that I studied as a child were, were not people that God specially chose to reveal its presence to. The chosen people of, of, of old times, Old Testament times, were not chosen because God reached out and said, I like you better than I like others. But the saints and the mystics and the chosen people are the people who chose God. They decided to make the direct approach. They decided to make the experience of the presence of God the most real, the most tangible, the most palpable thing in their lives. And that's what they dedicated themselves to. And each and every one of us has the ability to do that. No saint, no sage, no mystic has, has a greater insight or ability on on how to do that than you and I do. It is not because they were special or different. It is just simply because they made up their minds. They chose to do so. So we have to recognize that the way that the divine creates is a two-step process. There's a spontaneity, which is love, and then there is a, a, an unfoldment in a, in a methodical manner, which is law. There's the involution, and then there is the evolution. The, the divine decides that it will have a universe, and the process of evolution produces a universe. The divine decides that it will have plants and animals of every kind, and there is a process of evolution that evolves and gives us plants and animals in every kind. Two steps, spontaneity, love, spontaneity for expression, spontaneity for joy. Why <coughs> I'm so sorry. Why does the divine create? Why does God do what God does? And it can only do it for joy. That which already has everything, that which already is everything, does not create out of need does not create out of lack. You know. We go out and look for food because we're hungry. We create a meal because we're hungry. But the divine has no such need. It lacks nothing. So the only reason that it creates then, the only reason it does what it does is for joy to enjoy itself experiencing life in a new way through a new starting point, which is for you, <clears throat> as you, and as I. So the love part is to create beings as ourselves, beings capable of being a unique starting place. And then the law part is the evolution that has moved the creative impulse from the rock to the plant, to the animal, to the human. And now we are what Thomas Troward would call entering the fifth kingdom, the spiritual being, the being that is perfectly capable of recognizing its oneness with God. So Dr. Holmes tells us that the best approach is the direct approach. And we know that, that our culture over thousands of years has made the indirect approach, the hard approach, the difficult approach, the abstract approach. They have made that the approach, and it doesn't work. We have tried to find God through through all kinds of occult rituals. We have tried to find God through, through, through all kinds of things. We have looked for God in many, many different places, and the only place that we will find God is 
within. Right where we are. Right as we are. And the only way that we can do that, now, now burning incense and listening to, to chants and those sorts of things, they can help us because they can help us to attune our consciousness, but they are not, they are not what is doing it. They are not what is causing us the God experience. We have to be very clear on that. that there's no magic. There's no magical words that we can chant. There's no abracadabras. What there is is consciousness. There is our awareness. There is our ability to focus our minds on what we want and to place that object of our intention into that same law of mind that creates when God said, let there be light. Now, Dr. Holmes tells us that all scientific discovery works the same way. You know, gravity, gravity has been here forever, and people, people a long time ago, before they even had a word for gravity, knew that, knew that something was there, that if they tossed a rock up in the air, it would come back down. They knew it was there. They may not have had a word for it. They may not have had a mathematical formula to describe its interaction, but they knew it was there. But through a, a spontaneous act of curiosity, told if the myth is true, Isaac Newton sitting under the tree and the apple falls and, and hits him on the head, and he wants to know, well, how did that happen? And because his mind was attuned to mathematics, he developed a mathematical explanation of how gravity worked. A relationship of the mass of the two objects and the distance between them. He was able to explain how gravity worked. He still doesn't know what gravity is. We still don't know to this day what gravity is. We can describe it mathematically. We can describe it through, through the theory of relativity, but we don't know what it is. And Dr. Holmes kind of, kind of tells it really doesn't matter because once Newton was able to describe it, well then anybody who is willing to figure out what he said could then work with the law of gravity. We see our scientists sending spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles away and landing them onto a comet. Because we know enough about how gravity works, even though we don't know what it is, we know enough about how it works to get tangible results. And what we know about our interaction with, with, with God, with mind, we know that whatever we want, whatever we want to know, whatever we want to experience, that all we have to do is to create the mental equivalent. We have to attune our consciousness to it. And that anyone who will do this will get a result. That God is not going to say, Jim, I'll give you a result, but, but someone else I'm not going to give a result. Anyone who will take the time to learn how it works and to cooperate with it and make the direct approach, the simple approach, the law will cooperate with. So if what we desire in our spiritual growth is the experience of God, then let's attune our consciousness to the presence of God. Let's declare our intention to experience God and then let's give our attention to discovering God all about us. In the miracle of the air we breathe, the animals we see, the plants that grow, the sunrise, the sunset. It is already here. The gifts have already been given. But we must attune our consciousness to accept. 
So what it does is it creates, through a process of love, spontaneous awareness, and law, evolution. And it creates by becoming the very thing that has been created. That means that you and I are part of its creation, an integral part of its creation, and we are created in its image and likeness. We have been given conscious awareness so that we too can spontaneously create out of love. And then we can turn the whole thing over to the law and never worry. None of us doubts that gravity is going to continue to work. None of us should doubt that the law of mind is going to continue to work. And I suggest this year, as we go through this year, that our highest intention is for the experience of the presence of God and the activity of God in us, as us, through us. The human race has spent thousands and thousands of years making it harder than it needed to be, and you can see the result. I invite you to be amongst the ones who are willing to take the direct approach to shed fear and doubt and superstition to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the presence of God is already within you and to direct your consciousness through the power of treatment, through the power of effective prayer, to direct your consciousness, to accept that which already is. The love of God is here. You are it. Accept it. And so it is.